Hey guys, my name is SickabeeOT1, and well, if you thought the video game footage was just part of my April Fool's Day joke this year, well, it isn't. I've been meaning to do away with live action segments for a while now, and now I have a couple of reasons for that. But that's for another video, maybe. In the meantime, let's talk top 20, shall we? I'll be honest, I don't mind this year. People have already been calling this a bad year, and... It has barely started, give it some time. Granted, there have been a fair number of songs that have muscled in to take over 2018, and it's been a bit of a mixed bag. We've had despicable trends, but in my opinion, we've also had quite a lot of good come in early on. And with new rules I'm planning on implementing for my lists at the end of the year, I'm a little scared that I won't have space on my list for everything that I love so far. But just how good are we doing right now? That's where this top 20 ranking comes in. However, this time, I'm gonna try something different. I'll still be ranking each song from 0 to 5, but instead of starting with my least favorite of these songs, I'll actually be starting with the top of the meh tier and working down to the bottom of the awful tier, then I'll pick up at the bottom of the decent tier and work up to the great tier. After all, that's kinda how worst and best lists work respectively. With that in mind, here's my favorite of the songs that I mostly don't care about. This is the definition of a song I respect more than I actually like it. And for certain people, I can see it being a positive outlet for one's frustration with others' expectations. It's not badly written, and it shows NF's technical skills as a rapper fairly well. Plus, it's certainly more interesting than the other Eminem Light offerings I've heard from him. But where this song starts to lose me is the production. Sorry that I left. On the chorus especially, this feels way too crowded for its own good. We're stuffed with loud, pitch-shifted vocals, later on layered with NF singing. I guess I'll give him credit for being a better singer than Eminem, though that's not really a high bar to reach by any means. But the last chorus in particular, with all these harmonies, is just too much. Plus, I always found the drums a little too harsh on the verses, too loud and too quick-paced for what it's trying to do. But again, I can see the appeal to this. It's primal, it's cathartic. If you like it, more power to you and I can definitely respect that, but for me, I'm not feeling it. This is your average world star hip hop viral hit that gets popular for like a week and then fades away, except that it's somehow stuck around for over a month in the top 20. And I refuse to believe it's for any reason other than Drake. His parts are the only things that I can see people remembering, except for one line from Blockboy about a stat sheet or something. Big words coming from someone who won't be relevant in a month, and isn't even relevant now when you think about it. Yeah, I'm just gonna file this song under doesn't exist and go about my day. Walk it like I talk it. Walk it. Walk it like I talk it. Walk it. Also doesn't really matter. It's here because of Drake and because of the video, which I choose to interpret as an homage to Nirvana's In Bloom video. As for the song itself, well, you know Versace, arguably Migos' most famous song before Bad and Bougie came along? Well, Walk It Talk It to me is basically the 2018 version of that song. It's the same repetitive hook that means nothing, only this time it's not a product placement, and it's now delivered like Quavo doesn't care about anything. I'll give Versace this, Quavo actually sounded enthused on the hook in that song. Here, it's just dead. There's no reason to return to this after you've seen the video once. And even then, honestly the video's only novelty is that it doesn't fit the song. And this is probably gonna be the next single too. Joy. And to introduce the bad tier, a song people seem to like for some reason. I listened to Camilla the album on the day of its release and thought it wasn't very good, not god awful by any stretch, but outside of Havana and Something's Got to Give, there wasn't a lot that grabbed me. I will say though that this was my least favorite song on the album, so at least it didn't have any zeros. With that being said, Camilla's performance on this is ear piercing and unpleasant, which was discouraging going into this album because I was previously hopeful she would use the success of Havana as a motivation to refine her voice. Instead, this just feels like a regression. That nicotine heroine line is particularly hard to sit through because you can tell whoever was in charge of the vocal production was trying too hard to salvage her pitch here, and nearly approached the uncanny valley with it. And I've said before that Camilla's pitchiness didn't have to be an inherently bad thing if the production could compensate, or if it fit naturally with the song. But 
I can't say either of those things about this. This beat feels like a drunken slurry with cheap, thudding percussion. It sounds confused as to what mood it's trying to set. Maybe similar to the mood I Don't Wanna Live Forever was trying to set. And in my eyes, that's not a good song to aspire to be. You had me, then you lost me, Camilla. Better luck next time, I guess. I woke up in Chris Brown's body. I finished the script and then my opinion on this song changes. Hooray! I woke up Chris Breezy. The first time I heard this, I thought it was funny. And then I realized that I wished pretty much anyone other than Chris Brown was the featured artist, that anyone other than DJ Mustard was producing it, and that the jokes didn't default to observational humor and racial jokes. Yeah, this wore out its welcome pretty quickly with me. And I do want to make it clear that I don't hate Lil Dicky in the same way everyone else does. I actually like Save That Money from 2015, and there's also the song Professional Rapper, which I found enjoyable too. And it's because of this that I'm a little inclined to place more of the blame on Chris Brown for this. After all, he delivers some of the more cringy lines in this, even if he's supposed to be singing as Lil Dicky. Though Dicky himself doesn't really have the best flows here and barely even rhymes, so that sucks me out of this. I will say, though, that I think a song revolving around body swapping could be a funny idea if the writing is good, which here it obviously isn't. But depending on who would perform a song like this, it could have the potential to actually be funny. But that's missed potential, I suppose. A couple things I do still like about this, though, are the cameos from Ed Sheeran and DJ Khaled, with a self-aware joke apiece. It's way less cool than being Chris Brown was. Even though I would choose to be Ed Sheeran before choosing to be Chris Brown. And Kendall Jenner's cameo at the very end goes on way too long and is just uncomfortable. Easily the worst part of the song. So, yeah, while I don't hate it quite as much as, say, Spectrum Pulse, this soured on me pretty hard. Kendrick, I love you, but you need to be more selective with the artists you endorse. Seriously. And yet, it's hard to say if association with Kendrick is what made this so big. Like, I don't like New Freezer, but because of the feature, it would have made more sense for that song to be in the top 20 instead of this. Because when he's on his own, what does Rich the Kid really offer? He's got a nasal delivery, his hooks and bars have awkward pauses in them, relying way too much on the beat, he's got nothing that sets him apart from every other rapper these days, and he doesn't even sound that interested in what he's doing. I make money when I talk. Yeah? So does every rapper and singer in the mainstream. That's kind of underwhelming as a boast, dude. Beat is also bare bones. I get what it's trying to do with being spacey thanks to the beeping synths, but drowning it out with trapped percussion and not really giving any clear melody does little to actually make it interesting. How the hell did this get so big? Was it Spotify playlists? It was probably Spotify playlists. Rap Caviar needs some serious retooling. I've seen people say they're confused as to how anyone could not like this song. Honestly, I envy them. Because for me, this is somehow both incredibly bland and incredibly annoying, and I blame Zed for most of that. Mostly because I'm not sure which parts Grey contributed. I don't like the loud, amplified sounds, I don't like the clock ticking sound effects ripped from Stay, and I don't like how auto-tuned Marin Morris is. Which hurts to say because ordinarily I think she's a charming vocalist. Even on other songs where she essentially abandons any kind country identity like with 80s Mercedes. I'm not bothered by her participation in this song because she's a country vocalist singing a pop song. It's not pretending to be country, no one's calling it that. It's EDM pop and it knows it. No, what bothers me about her being in this song is that it doesn't really take advantage of her talents as a singer. Her auto-tune and the incredibly generic writing don't show off any real personality other than I heart you. And fine, there's a place for shallow music like this, but sometimes a song can be so shallow that there's basically no reason for it to exist. Well, aside from the fact that it was made for Target commercials. I'm not even gonna rant about the corporate reason this song exists because I don't really care, but I will say this. I live in Minnesota, so Target is pretty much everywhere here, and as such, this company is pretty much essential to my life. But the existence of this song kind of makes me feel bad for Target employees, because if I'm already sick of this after, like, three listens, I can only imagine what it's like for you if you work at the store and have to hear this 30 times a day around the electronics department. So, yeah, I don't really like this. Sorry. Awful tear ahoy! My bottom two isn't going to surprise you. It is meant to be. Remember when I gave this a 1 out of 5? 
Well, that was back when I had barely heard this song. It wasn't until I recently re-listened to the entire Hot 100 that I realized that this is completely worthless. I'm just gonna set aside the debate about whether this is country or not. To me, that ultimately has little bearing on this song's quality. What does is Florida Georgia Line essentially recycling Holy, which I put on my worst list of 2016. It's got the same saccharine piano line, gross sounding auto tune, and faux mature writing, and yet they made it even worse with the addition of trap percussion which is just a mixing nightmare. Also, FLG's vocal performance here is kinda worse than normal. When it's just them singing the chorus, it sounds really off. After all, the melody is a harmonization that's meant to take a backseat to Baby Rex's melody, and it doesn't feel developed enough to really stand out on its own, I guess. Or maybe I'm just too used to this part having both singers. Also, Baby and FLG have little to no chemistry, what with the fake twang and auto-tune trying to complement Baby's typical dead-eye shtick. Not to mention how Baby mentions in her verse that she's wary because she's been hurt before, but that's undermined when FLG finished her verse by saying she's beautiful. Cause I'm tired of the fake love, show me what you made up. Oh, hold up girl, don't you know you're beautiful? It's like they weren't even paying attention, and yet it's that one line that somehow makes her willing to give this thing a try. And it's because of this that Baby Rexa feels like the real featured artist on this song and not FLG. Story of her life, I guess. You guys didn't listen to me, or Pearl, or Andrew about X, and now look where we are. I legitimately thought that we were done with this guy after 17 faded from public memory. Jocelyn Flores seemed to become a big hit, and Look At Me was only barely a hit. But now he's got a top 10 hit, because why not? And with one of his most morally offensive songs to date, no less. I mean, instrumentally, it's it's not as bad as Look At Me, but it feels stilted thanks to the clattering percussion and X's mumbling cadence, and also with the hook being longer than the one verse that this song boasts, which is all standard fare for this kid, really. But the reason this is the worst song on the top 20 right now is because of the subject matter. This is manipulation, plain and simple. Manipulation a girl into staying with you by threatening to commit suicide. This isn't sad or relatable or cathartic or anything the song wants to be. It's gaslighting. X is trivializing mental health and suicide in order to get his way with this girl, and both his abuse allegations and the fact that an anti-suicide song was a top five hit just last year make this especially inexcusable. Hell, I'll even give credit to EXO Tour Life as much as I don't like it for handling suicide in a way that had more tact and grace. But you know what the really sad part is? This isn't even the worst song from X's new album that I've heard, and I've heard less than half the album. I can only imagine how much I would hate the whole thing if I tried to listen to it. X doesn't deserve your time, your money, or space in your brain, and I just gave him too much attention by just talking about him here. I should have done what Rodrigo did and avoided hearing this like the plague, but I didn't. As for everyone else, it's not too late to be better. Don't normalize abuse, don't validate this kind of behavior, and don't support terrible people who make terrible art. Listen to better artists, and let this kid fade away into obscurity. Okay, I'm happy again, so let's knock out the 11 songs here I actually enjoy listening to. SZA really frustrates me. On one hand, I can acknowledge that she's a very talented vocalist. She has a unique presence and some decent songwriting chops, but like with Cardi B, I think my problem with her is that she often doesn't have production that really gels with me. Love Galore was a cluttered mess, The Weeknd is really dull, and I just flat out hate Broken Clocks. All the stars thankfully doesn't have this problem. The beat is very ethereal and well fleshed out, which fits SZA's voice remarkably well, but beyond that the song doesn't really grab me that much. I do like it, but it's not something that keeps me coming back again and again. Maybe it's Kendrick? I guess he sounds a little bored doing this, though his writing is still pretty good. I can see a little bit how this fits in with the themes of Black Panther, which I would tell you to watch right now, but you've probably already seen it, and also I'm not really a movie buff, so whatever. Yeah, this is good, but nowhere near my favorite from the Black Panther soundtrack. This song is cute. Like, really, really cute. And at points, that's kind of a fault. But at others, it's charming enough. It's got some tinges of psychedelic. I especially love the way the harps kick in at the end of each line of the first verse. Now that's charming. And strangely, I think that's what makes the first verse here stick out more for me than the chorus. That, and it ultimately feels more flattering. 
aside from the hit it from the back line. That kind of kills the mood by putting it in a more sexual context than I feel he can really pull off. But even still, this is incredibly chill. Pretty easy to vibe to thanks to its tropical feel and precious lyrics. Though to this song's detriment, the second verse and bits of the chorus feel a bit too forceful. It should feel more delicate and charming. It's almost abrupt how it ends too. Like, the chorus doesn't really sound like it's finished the second time through. I just gotta say it almost sounds like it wants to transition into a bridge, which would have been perfect. But you know, it's a vibe. It decent. But you know what's good? <sighs> Drake. I've been moving calm, don't start no trouble with me. Trying to keep it peaceful. When this first hit number one, I was confused. I mean, sure, there was bound to be hype for Drake to finally make new music, but this debuting at number one didn't make sense to me. Hell, it staying there for ten straight weeks makes even less sense. And yet, I guess it was something that I needed. I especially like the beat to this, the distorted organ sound reminds me of ballpark music. It's a cool sound, alright? Plus, Drake rapping with a sing-song flow is much preferable to him just straight up rapping, at least most of the time. After all, most of this guy's biggest songs are the ones where he sings rather than raps. And it helps that his writing here isn't quite as infuriating as it's been in his other songs lately. I mean, there is the issue where he tries bringing up people not liking him for sympathy, but considering how defensive rappers tend to get when addressing their haters, I think this is honestly a step up. Plus, there's some agreeable sentiments here, what with his shoutouts to his friends that helped him get to where he is today, including one who unfortunately passed away last year. Rest in peace, 50 World, even though I never heard of you before this song. So yeah, still not one of Drake's best songs ever or anything, and it still does bother me how it's been firmly lodged into the number one spot for the past two months, but it's a grower. Though the song he just released is actually a lot better, so there is that. Holy crap, Migos can actually be good when they set their minds to it. Though to be fair, I think Pharrell's beat is the biggest reason this song works so well. You could argue it's a bit dated since it was shelved for a decade before finally being used here, but I don't care. It's more colorful and fun than the trap beats Migos are accustomed to. It fits the Asian theme going on here to a T without being racist. Now that is impressive. Plus, all three members of Migos here have some entertaining moments here. You got Quavo's hypnotic auto-tuned hook, takeoff spits about not discriminating. Given things the other two have said, I think someone could learn a thing or two from him. And Offset, okay, he's the weak link here, especially with that line about boogers. But his energy is still high, and that Five Guys line is kinda clever. Now maybe if more of the songs on Culture 2 were more like this and less like Walk It Talk It, I'd actually give a damn about this. But nope, they had to make the same song over and over again to dominate Spotify playlists. Isn't that lovely? There are seven perfect fives this time around. And people say this has been a bad year for music. Oh yeah, I already liked this before, and it's only grown on me since. I think what's helped is that Young Thug's verse finally clicked with me. It's still not a highlight of the song, especially when you have a sax solo and Camilla's sultry performance to compete with, but it's a nice touch regardless. I was happy to see this reach number one, if only for a week. It deserved to be there over Rockstar without a doubt. On one hand, we gave this guy a solo top 20 hit just a couple months after that stupid I cannot vibe with queers line, but on the other hand, it's one of the best things he's ever made, so it's something I kinda have to forget about. I like to look at this as a better version of Bad and Bougie. Metro Boomin beat that really isn't that complex with Offset, dropping a hook that's honestly not that bad. The difference here is that it's much quicker, the beat is bassier, and it's just Offset rapping this time around. And holy crap, he is awesome here. Not only is his chorus really catchy, but his technique on the second verse puts me in awe. I had no idea he could speed up his triplet flow that much, my god. And yeah, the lyrics are mostly just mindless flexing, but this is flat out hypnotic, just what I like. And also, surprisingly, the album this is on is not that bad. Not amazing, and that's mostly because of 21 Savage, but there's some bangers on this. Check it out if you're curious. I think the world is about to end. I wasn't crazy about this song when I first heard it, but something kept me coming back repeatedly, and eventually, I guess I kinda welcomed Post Alone into my life. 
I get it now. I feel the vibes. From the plinking bells to post-soothing crooning. These are vibes I haven't been able to feel from this guy in pretty much any other song he's released. Closest he's gotten before is with Candy Paint. But with more oomph thanks to the huge sounding bass, I'd argue that this is better. And I also argue that this is a much more effective celebration track than Congratulations was. He sounds elated to have finally hit his stride here, and he's not rubbing it in your face like he was before. Oh, and Ty Dolla Sign is here, I think. Okay, I'm bumping this down to a 4 for that line alone. This is now number 7. God, what an awful word that should never be used in music, ever. What you've been hearing about this song for the past few months is true. This is an incredible new Jack Swing throwback that absolutely deserves to be as huge as it is now. And the funny thing is that I had forgotten all about this song prior to it being remixed, even though I had listened through 24 Karat Magic at least twice before this released. How did this not stand out to me? Well, to be fair, the Cardi B remix is better. This version starts out more naturally thanks to her verse, and some of the production is cranked up to make it sound even better. It's kinda hard to go back to the album version now, let's just leave it at that. But no matter the version, the beat is on point, and Bruno sounds like he's having the time of his life on the dance floor. I wish Cardi B had more involvement, even if her opening verse is great and her backing vocals towards the end really drive it home. But for what it is, Bruno and Cardi knocked it out of the park with this. Now why this song never hit number one and even recently got passed by meant to be of all songs, I'll never understand. Yeah. Quintessential Ed Sheeran. I'll have more to say about this in December, assuming I don't burn myself out on this, but for now, I'll say it's a genuinely heartfelt acoustic ballad that tickles me pink every time I hear it. It's one of the few songs that makes me feel like the girl Ed is singing to, and I hope that's not weird to think about. One, two, don't New roll. Oh, this is still great. This topped my ranking in the winter, but I didn't have the chance to really say anything about it. Well, here goes. Talking in my sleep at night, making myself crazy. Dua Lipa shows herself to be a force of personality with this song, dealing with her conflicting emotions about a guy who's burned her, but she still has feelings for. And the writing is incredibly mature, yet scathing at the same time. The pre-chorus in particular is another one of my favorite moments in music in recent memory. On top of just being the medic as hell, it is pure fire. And to follow it up with a drop this schizophrenic is absolutely amazing. I can see this drop being irritating to some, but for me, it strengthens Dua's reputation as someone you just don't jerk around with. She's vengeful, she's vicious, and she's cold. At least, that's the image that she tries to project at times. We do also get to see some of her more vulnerable moments juxtaposed against her ranting, and it's absolutely brilliant for that. It's no wonder that this has been one of the most praised hits of the past couple years. It deserves it, and I'm incredibly relieved it managed to become a sleeper hit in the United States rather than getting caught between years like we originally predicted. And yet, this time around, one song managed to impress me even more. You won't pray for me. May not be sidewalks, but I don't care. For me, this is the song that better represents the Black Panther movie. Dark, brooding production with writing about what being a hero means for two of the biggest names in music right now. They've got expectations placed upon them, but still face uncertainty. No one is indestructible after all. And despite literally being about being a superhero, this avoids being cheesy and instead is actually stylized and really cool. Plus the political commentary in Kendrick's verse is well executed. It's on the nose for one, and ties in perfectly with the idea of needing to depend on others to survive. And all in all, this production is absolutely incredible. I wasn't wild about that one booming grace note at first, but it grew on me, as the rest of the beat showed itself to be satisfying as hell with its dark wave vibes. It's pretty polished and commercial, yeah, but that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Plus, it's a beat that works exceptionally well for the weekend's typical crooning, with enough grit to work for Kendrick much better than all the stars did. This is absolutely addictive for me, and I wouldn't be surprised if this ends up being my most listened to song by the end of the year. It's that good. So all in all, I'm a little conflicted. A good chunk of the top 20 right now is not very good, but to compensate, there's a lot of amazing songs on display, even if one of them is a repeat from last year. My score for this week is a 58 out of 100, and I pray that something shifts around to prop that score up even higher. Let's have a good year, alright? But for now, take care.
Hey guys, thanks for watching. Sorry if the game footage was not what you're expecting, but like I said, I might be making a video explaining why that is. Also, shout out to Andrew Prep who inspired the style of this video. He makes great stuff and you should go support him right now. And bye!